Thank you very much for coming to this talk, and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. And I was assigned this topic to compare the uh, guidelines that came out in the past year from the American College of Rheumatology, which came out in June of 2012, were published then, to the European League Against Rheumatism guidelines that were done jointly with the European Renal Association, European Dialysis and Transplant Association, which I think is a real advantage. And the first author there is Bertius and colleagues in the Annals of Rheumatic Disease in November of 2012. So I gave a lot of thought to this because I thought, how can you make a talk interesting that compares you know, details here and there? So I thought I would start with my overview slide, which is, in comparison, these guidelines are very similar. And I will show you some of the differences, but the message to take away is they're very similar. In the treatment of lupus nephritis, in addition to glucocorticoids, mycophenolate and cyclophosphamide are the anchors of induction therapy. And I will show you that. Now let me also say for both of these sets, the recommendations are intended for use in daily practice by physicians who treat lupus nephritis. So there's a real attempt to make them practical and useful. On the other hand, none of them are to replace the physician's best judgment. So you won't find in either set of these guidelines statements like the following approach is not recommended to the point of being contraindicated. You won't find that because you who are sitting with your patient are the best judge of what the next therapeutic choice should be. So these are just guidelines. The methods are similar, they're not identical, but the idea is the same. First, there is an extensive literature review, and that's all decided in advance what papers qualify, what papers don't qualify. And then an expert panel is convened, and the members of that panel review the literature, and they construct recommendations by various methods that usually re involve some type of voting so that you can see which of the um, the recommendations are strongly supported by the panel. Others maybe not quite so much agreement. And only recommendations are offered if there is agreement of a vast majority of the panel. And then after the panels of experts finish, the recommendations are submitted to the sponsoring organizations, ACR or ULAR um, in this case. And then if they're approved by the appropriate committees in that organization, then they're published. So it is a rather extensive and careful um, choice, and it's a combination of what's in the literature and what I think everyone would agree as appropriate experts uh, think is most likely to be correct. In addition that, to that, to help you when you're looking at these, <clears throat> there is listed by both groups the quality of the recommendation based on evidence. So if there is, and I'll show you that on the slides, if I put a green A there, that means the evidence is derived from multiple randomized controlled trials, perspective, and usually, or often if, if best of all possible worlds, a meta-analysis like Dr. Husso showed you. A B grade is still a pretty good, pretty solid recommendation. The evidence is based on a single a randomized controlled trial or a non-randomized study, almost always prospective and not retrospective. Level C, the recommendation is based on consensus of the expert opinion, but there are usually case series or retrospective studies to support um, that recommendation. Now I want to go over the following aspects and I'm going to compare them for you. <clears throat> What did the two groups say about renal biopsy? Background therapies for everyone who has lupus nephritis, the best induction therapies for class three, four, and five, and may I put the caveat in here that both groups felt that to treat class five, patients should be nephrotic because it's controversial whether patients with pure class five 
and mild proteinuria require um, any treatment. So when I say five, I'm talking about nephrotic range proteinuria. Both groups commented on maintenance therapy. Both groups dealt with therapy in those who don't respond to the induction therapy. And both groups dealt with ther therapy in pregnant patients with lupus nephritis. So let's talk about renal biopsy. The recommendations here are virtually identical. This is the way the ACR stated it. <clears throat> Every patient with any clinical evidence of active lupus nephritis previously untreated should undergo renal biopsy unless strongly indicated, contraindicated. And the uh, ULAR term for this is that renal biopsy is indispensable in choosing the best induction therapy. <coughs> Both groups said biopsy results should be classified by the current ISN RPS 2003 classification, which I'll show you on the next slide, with additional information on activity, chronicity, and vascular disease in the biopsy. And both groups said the recommended therapeutic strategies are based on knowing the classification of nephritis on renal biopsy. No guessing based on clinical evidence about what the histologic class of the patient is because none of the clinical indicators are very good in that regard. Now here is the classification, the 2003 classification by these two renal groups, pathologists and, and renal groups. You'll see over on the right hand side if there's class one or two, which is disease confined to the mesangium. No immunosuppression is recommended by either of these groups. Class three, four, and five nephrotic immunosuppression is recommended, and I'll show you what that is. Class six, the advanced sclerosing nephritis with greater than 90% globally sclerosis and no activity in the biopsy should not receive immunosuppression. Now, where I've put slides in this aqua blue color. That means these are ULAR recommendations that were not made by the ACR. And they were very good in defining renal response, which the ACR criteria go, don't do, and I think this is a definite advance for ULAR. A complete renal response, which is your goal, is proteinuria less than 500 milligram per 24 hours. And you can use a protein creatinine ratio doesn't have to be a 24-hour collection. And normal or near normal GFR, glomerular filtration rate, within 10% of the normal. That is a complete renal response to your induction therapy. If you can't do that, hopefully you can achieve a partial renal response, and that's defined as greater than or equal to 50% decrease in proteinuria to subnephrotic levels, so that would be less than three grams for 24 hours. And normal to near normal GFR, that's a partial renal response. Now, there is a difference now. We depart here in the third bullet. And you heard the discussion by Dr. Housseau, based in part on some of his data. The ACR felt that you should achieve this complete response or partial response by six months and if you don't, you should consider changing the therapy. The ULAR recommendations <clears throat> say you can have up to 12 months before you make that decision. So that is a difference in the guidelines. I brought this, which is Dr. Husso's early study on low dose versus high dose, uh, to tell you why it might be that ULAR thinks we should give, can give it 12 months. So the first blue arrow there shows the response to IV cyclophosphamide at six months. And that's only 20% of patients. By 12 months, which is the second blue arrow roughly, you get your 50% response. And if you stay with what you're doing, as you see on the graphic, you will capture a few more people improving over the ensuing two to three years. So I show you this to show you response is slow and why you might consider 12 months as your final point uh, instead of six months. On the other hand, 
in the MMF studies, which I have put in blue over on the right-hand side of the slide, there was a 50% response rate, roughly, achieved at six months, and this both the Ginsler and the Appel studies. So the ACR experts went for uh, decide at six months whether you have a complete response, partial response, and consider changing your therapy. Now, where I've put the slides in this deep blue purple, it looked purple on my computer, uh, that means there's almost total agreement between ACR and ULAR. So they agree on adjunctive therapies that all patients with lupus nephritis should be treated with. Everybody on hydroxychloroquine because it helps reduce the amount of damage in multiple studies. Everybody on angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ARBs for proteinuria greater than 500 milligrams per 24 hours or an equivalent protein creatinine ratio or for hypertension, ACE or ARB. Remember that for your management of hypertension in patients with lupus nephritis. There are pretty good evidence that they are superior to other methods of controlling hypertension in reducing um, end-stage renal disease. This is an A-level recommendation. Maintain blood pressure lower than 130 over 80, different from the old 140 over 90, lower. 130 over 80 is your target. A-level evidence for reducing end-stage renal disease. Statins for LDL greater than 100, both groups recommended this. It's only a C level. We don't have um, particularly good evidence in lupus that that makes a difference in outcome. Pregnancy counseling for fertile women was added by the ACR, which is in yellow, and the ULAR, which is in this light blue. To reduce damage, consider aspirin if patients have antiphospholipid antibody, calcium and vitamin D supplements, and immunization with non-live vaccines. And ULAR also re recommended that you should consider anticoagulation in all patients with the nephrotic syndrome since they have an increased risk for clotting. Here in yellow are the ACR recommendations. So you've decided you have a class three, four, or five nephrotic patient. You're going to induce improvement. According to the ACR and ULAR, which is the blue arrow, you can start with MMF two to three grams a day for six months. And the ACR noted that it, uh, this is preferred to cyclophosphamide in African Americans and Hispanics, Latinos, uh, because there is good data that they don't respond as well to cyclophosphamide as they do to MMF. The European guidelines do not uh, break it down by race. This is A-level evidence for mycophenolate. Plus glucocorticoids stay in the left-hand box there. And both ULAR and ACR recommended pulse steroids, followed by prednisone, and ULAR recommends 0.5 mg per kg. The ACR begged the issue and said you can use from 0.5 to 1 mg per kg, which is a more US approach per day, tapered after a few weeks to the lowest effective dose, and use the higher dose if there are crescents in the biopsy. In the light blue at the bottom of the slide, the ULAR was more um, insistent about what you do with steroids. Taper prednisone after four weeks, remember you're starting at 0.5 mg per kg, and taper it to equal to or less than 10 milligrams a day by four to six months of therapy. Very precise recommendations about what to do with your daily steroids. Now let me hurry to say that for these steroid, the use in induction therapy, notice it has a red C on the left of it. And that's because there are really no high quality data to inform us whether you really need a pulse to start induction therapy effectively, and there are no high quality data to tell us if 0.5 mg per kg is different from 1 mg per kg, either in efficacy or in toxicity, although we all think the toxicity is worse at the higher doses. So that's mycophenolate and steroids. On the right hand, is cyclophosphamide plus the same steroid regimen I already discussed. For the ACR, we said you can use either low-dose cytoxan in that lower left box or high-dose cytoxan, kind of whichever one you prefer. 
the ULAR is talking, thinks you should start with low-dose cyclophosphamide, and that's based on their European studies. And they have said on, in the light blue there that you should choose the high-dose cyclophosphamide if there are adverse prognostic factors like uh, a lot of crescents in the biopsy or a lot of necrosis in the biopsy. So that's where we stand on low dose versus high dose. For induction therapy, this is European, as you can tell by the blue color in the background. For induction therapy, azathioprine may be used as an alternative to MMF or cyclophosphamide in selected patients without adverse prognostic factors or when other drugs are contraindicated or not tolerated. But you have to be aware that azathioprine has a higher flare rate than the mycophenolate and the cyclophosphamide regimens. The ACR did not rank azathioprine as a top drug for induction therapy, so this is a difference. Both groups indicated in the bright blue in pure class 5 with nephrotic range proteinuria, um, mycophenolate plus oral prednisone half a mg per kg per day may be used as initial treatment, and that's based on recent studies. Cyclosporine, um, I'm say cyclophosphamide or calcineurin inhibitors or rituximab are alternative options for the management of membranous lupus nephritis or for non-responders. And uh, the ACR did not recommend cyclophosphamide or calcineurin inhibitors or rituximab as an equivalent first choice to MMF. Now here again, I'm going to the ACR with the, the yellow background, and here we have a bit of a difference. We all know what to do if a patient does well. <clears throat> so on the top, the patient's starting on MMF, and on the right-hand side, they're starting on cyclophosphamide. If they're improved in either group, they should be then maintained with either mycophenolate, one to two grams per day, a slightly lower dose, or azathioprine, approximately two milligram per kilogram per day, with necessary low-dose daily glucocorticoid if you have to use it. And that is exactly the same in both the ACR and the ULAR guidelines. Now, there's some differences in the patients who don't improve. So the ACR suggested if you start MMF, you're not improved at six months, you should go to cyclophosphamide. And if you start cyclophosphamide, you aren't improved in six months, you should go to MMF. And ULAR agrees with the approach for cyclophosphamide. Then if you go another six months and you don't improve, according to the ACR, follow down toward the middle of the slide, you should be treated with rituximab or calcineurin inhibitors with glucocorticoids. The ULAR moved up rituximab in this group. And they have suggested that if you have a patient who fails initial induction therapy at six or 12 months, whatever you want to decide, Rituximab is an acceptable second approach to that patient, and, um, and ACR ranked it lower. So that is an important difference. Now, ULAR added a very important caveat at the bottom there. Maintenance therapy in responders should be continued at least three years. I think that's very important, and the ACR did not have that in the guidelines. Now, since we're talking about issues of if your patient isn't better at six months, should you change or should you wait till 12 months? Let's talk about what you can tell early because those aren't terribly practical questions you'd like to know that your patient is responding long before 12 months. So this is a study by Dalera and her colleagues and this is after eight weeks of treatment from the trials with mycofentanyl compared to cytoxin. <coughs> If there's equal to or greater than 25% reduction in proteinuria, normalization of complement, your odds are increased about threefold that the patient's going to have a good response. So at eight weeks, you should be seeing a signal in these that tell you you have a response. If you aren't seeing that and you're not seeing it again by six months, you may want to move on. You've already seen this in individuals who have a good response to induction therapy and then are randomized to MMF versus azathioprine, this data published by Dooley suggests that over the next three years, mycophenolate is a little better in holding the response than azathioprine. 
the European long-term study where all people were randomized, whether or not they were good responders, shows that they're equal. So whichever one you like um, is, is certainly all right with me. The major reason you, you lose mycophenolate in these long-term good responders is because women want to become pregnant. And since it's so teratogenic, uh, you have to stop it about three months before people attempt pregnancy. So that's the major reason for use, um, losing mycophenolate. Here are additional recommendations from the ACR in the, the yellow here, and then I've added recommendations from ULAR at the bottom. If fertility is a major issue, MMF is a better choice than cyclophosphamide. However, in the low-dose cyclophosphamide, there's not good evidence that I can find that you lose fertility on those lower doses of cyclophosphamide. So certainly if you're gonna use high-dose cyclophosphamide, and people want to be fertile, MMF is a better choice. The ACR recommended that Asians receiving MMF should have a target maximum dose of two grams a day, and other races should have three. <clears throat> that was based on the ALMS trial where there were more deaths than expected in China, and there was concern that the dose was too high. I showed you likelihood of good response can be estimated at eight weeks. ULAR recommends you monitor every two to four weeks after diagnosis or flare, and then less frequently but lifelong, at least every three to six months. Monitor blood pressure and the uh, serum um, measures that I've listed up there, and check intermittently for antiphospholipid. And repeat the renal biopsy if people are worsening or they're refractory to therapy. The last slide here are recommendations for pregnancy, and because the highest number of letters to the editor came for this recommendation I'm going to cover. It. This is the ACR recommendation. We recommended in people with a history of lupus nephritis who have no evidence of disease activity at the time they're pregnant, uh, we don't do any treatment for SLE. The controversy there is that there's some data suggesting that pregnancy does better with uh, hydroxychloroquine. Thank you. Our center, center recommendation, if there's a history of lupus nephritis with mild disease activity, start hydroxychloroquine. It seems to be safe in pregnancy. There are good data for that and uh, better outcomes for mother in retrospective data. In clinically active lupus nephritis, you'll be forced to use glucocorticoids, use only the dose required to suppress activity, and of course avoid the fluorinated steroids which cannot be inactivated by placental enzymes, whereas unfluorinated steroids can be. So avoid those. And if it's necessary to reduce the glucocorticoid requirement or to control lupus nephritis, you can add azathioprine and if you don't exceed two milligram per kilogram per day. Uh, there is no evidence of fetal harm. ULAR recommends maintaining treatment for lupus during pregnancy. Of course, you can't use cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, or mycophenolate since they're all teratogenic, but they rec say that you can use steroids, azathioprine, or uh, cyclosporine, and the, the calcineurin inhibitors during pregnancy if you have to, to control the disease. And I'm going to stop there, and thank you very much for your attention.